This meeting is being recorded. I'm doing well. How are hey, you? Nice to see you all. Nice to see you all. Hello, everyone. How are you? Thank Great. You so I'm, I'm running this thing in a way where I happen to have a group on Zoom and I also happen to have the extra, any, anything that overflows this Zoom room can go onto the YouTube channel. So I actually have two things that I'm monitoring at once. But I also want to say I, I learned a lesson from, uh, from John Mackey and, and from some of the other faculty, which is it's a lot more fun if we can have people interject. And so in the, in the Zoom room, feel free to unmute your mic and talk. Uh, it would actually be great to have some kind of interaction. And on the YouTube, if you're watching the YouTube, if you type into the chat, I can actually also see what you're typing in the chat. Let me try to see. So we still have some people coming in. Um, while people are coming in, I actually just, I'll just poll the audience. This is what I usually do at the beginning of any talk. Um, so how many people are here from 112 or 151 or 251 or uh, 128? If you can like type in the chat, that gives me some idea of you know the representation that we have here. Also, it makes it a little bit more interactive. Okay. So far, I see a lot of people in two fifty one. That's interesting. Cool. And we got. A, I see we got a lot, a lot of one twelve also. I must say, I had an enormous amount of fun talking about this with Anil Ada, John Mackey, and David Cosby when this thing was being ideated, because. This is a very interesting group of faculty, and everyone obviously really, really loves teaching. Everyone really loves trying to find ways to help other people as well. Okay. Well, I think we have enough people, so we can go ahead and start and get, and get started, because this, this, the goal of this was actually to make myself available to the people in the CMU community who are in these classes, uh, to talk a little bit about what we're doing here with an app that is actually changing the entire paradigm on how you might try to control COVID-19, which is cool. It's really wonderful that something like this is happening right in our backyard. Um, and also the, a large chunk of this hour, I actually want to leave for something that can be more interactive. I do want to make one thing clear at the beginning, just as a disclaimer. This is about Novid. Uh, well, I mean, the, the app we're talking about is about Novid. And as a disclaimer, this app Novid is actually, it's not officially a Carnegie Mellon made project. This is something that's run externally to Carnegie Mellon. I actually run my own social enterprise startup. Some of you know, it's called XP. And in fact, that's what initially funded and is in fact running all of, all of Novid outside of Carnegie Mellon. On the other hand, we've, we've, we've involved so many Carnegie Mellon students and the rest of the Carnegie Mellon community that it's, a great, it, it's with great pride that I'm coming to, coming to this audience to talk about it. Okay, so I see that some people are typing things in the chat too, which is cool. Uh, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who doesn't mind if people are having side conversations in the chat, whether the YouTube chat or the Zoom chat, uh, and hopefully this thing will be fun for you. The, the goal of this is to have something entertaining too. Okay. Well, so here we are at Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon is a very special university. Uh, it struck me since the beginning when I was here about how practical and how real the impact is of the kind of work that people do at CMU, as well as the kind of skills that people get by the time they graduate. I've actually run this social enterprise XP for over six years. And in my experience, the people who I have had the opportunity to work with from Carnegie Mellon, students and alumni, are incredible. It's amazing how you actually don't just learn great theory, but you also learn how to make stuff. And the making stuff is cool. Actually, a lot of you also may know of me as that math professor over there who teaches the Putnam Seminar. And you often may think of me as like the math guy who does math stuff. I, uh, today, I guess I'm gonna share a different side of me, which is the, the part which is playing with computers. In fact, I absolutely love working on all aspects of computer programming, software engineering, al algorithm development, hacking, hacking in a good way, um, trying to figure out how to make the most of any system that we have, whether it is a computer, an iPhone, or an Android phone. And today I wanted to talk a bit about Novid, which is the app that we are making available to the people at Carnegie Mellon University to try to stop the spread of COVID. Actually, here I want to do a poll, uh, because this is what I always do when I talk about Novid to a student community. Does anyone know what Novid does? Or what's your, what's your impression of what Novid does? There's no wrong answer. I just want to know what's your actual impression of what Novid does. And if you don't know and you say you don't know, that's cool too. 
There's, oh, uh, pull. <laughs> when I say pull, I mean like, I just go and ask. I'm sorry, I'm an old fashioned guy. My pull is best in the like talking way. Feel free to unmute your mic and just talk. It's, it's all cool. Oh, I see. You can, you can type in the chat or you can unmute, unmute, unmute your mic. Both are fine. Doesn't it keep track of your, if you come like into a close distance with another person that has Novid installed on their device, and then it keeps track of those people and if they get reported as positive? Aha, uh -huh. yes. So I'm seeing a lot of people who are answering in a way which makes sense and is indeed one of the things that we do, which is that if, if you are running Novid and you walk and you run into somebody else or spend time, spend time with somebody else, then it will tell you if you have been around somebody, well, if, they, if at some point they test positive, it would tell you, oh, you were around somebody who tested positive, and therefore that might help you know that you should quarantine so that you can prevent other people from getting sick. That is one of the things that we do. But the reason I'm giving this talk is because that's actually the least interesting thing that we do. However, what you just described is what many people call contact tracing apps, which is actually the kind of system that the whole world's been talking about. Everyone's been talking about apps that will track and see whether or not you have been around someone. And then if so, it'll ask you to please, mm -hmm. uh, please, please quarantine. Uh, one, one quick question. I'm totally, I, I totally love people unmuting to interject. That's cool. But if you are not planning to say something right now, please stop. Please mute the mic. It'll make it easier for everybody else. <laughs> okay. Cool. Actually, there's a, there's a fun trick in Zoom, which is that if you just go quiet, then I think the one who's making the noise will show up on the screen, and then, then we can be like, hey, psst, could you make it, could you quiet down, please? All right, but yeah, so, so the, the, least, the least interesting thing about the app is actually that part, because that's the standard paradigm. In fact, what we came up with is we said, let's use math. Let's use a math way of thinking and a computer science way of implementing it. What if instead we used the network that we anonymously collected, and we used that to make a COVID radar? A COVID radar, where here's what I mean by a paradigm shift, and I know there are people here also in 128 and 151. When we think about things with math, we want to crystallize it into a very simple way to say what is different. The old fashioned way is for every positive case, tell everyone who was directly exposed that they should go quarantine. Okay, that's one way. But another way is for every positive case, we could instead try to report how far away all of the other cases were from them. I'm just going to switch to this to draw something because it's easier to just draw. So the old fashioned way, traditional, is where if you have a positive case, then you go and find all of the people that they have had contact with and you tell each of those people that they should go in quarantine. That's the traditional way. And if we think about things as computer scientists, it's basically, uh, if there's a positive, then each of those people finds a Boolean. They find out a true or false that they have been exposed to a positive. And our idea, new, the new paradigm, is that for every positive case, go tell everyone. And this is called graph theory. Actually, there are some great classes in graph theory here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and, and if, you, if you take a class in graph theory, you'll definitely learn how to think about these things. But also when you're taking the computer science classes, there's lots of stuff that we do with networks and with graphs. And the new paradigm is that you just report, you tell everyone how far in the network that the case is. So for example, if you happen to be this person here. How far is the case? Well, the case is one, two, three. So the distance equals three. Does this make sense? So this is, this is the notion of the paradigm shift. So the paradigm shift is simply, for every positive case, don't just tell the people that were directly around. For every positive case, instead, tell everyone a number, an integer, which is how far away it was. I see there's a question already. So, oh, oh that wasn't a question. That was, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was a comment. But so now, if you, if you happen to do this, this is very different. It's not just telling that you've been directly adjacent. It's telling you how far away it is. It's changing the perspective on how you deal with the whole question. But why does this matter? So the reason why this is so powerful is because if you could tell how far away it is, then you can animate it over time like a weather radar, like this. 
So this is just an animation of what we hope that Carnegie Mellon will not look like. Uh, this is a graph, and, and we're going to do everything we can to make Carnegie Mellon not look like this. But unfortunately, there are places in the world that look like this right now. And this, as you can see, the date is changing. And if you just let the date change, and you draw a chart which says, here are how many, this is how many positive cases there are at each of those distances from here all the way out to there, if you, if you tell how high it is, well, how high it is tells you how many cases at each of these degrees of connection. And so since this is a Carnegie Mellon audience from the computer science and math side, I'll just simply say this axis is that graph theoretic distance. And so what we just saw in that previous thing would correspond to you know, somebody finding out that three relationships away from them, there was a COVID case. Now, why is this useful? Actually, now I'm curious. I want to also ask the audience. Suppose that this is what this radar is doing. How would you react? What would you do? Suppose you saw this picture, like this picture right here. Anyone want to share what they would do? Oh, actually, wait. I saw that somebody asked a question first. So before we go there, let me try to read the question. I'm going forward because I need to see. Ah, doesn't time have to do with it? If you interacted with this person, ah, yes, 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 yes. Okay, very important. Somebody said, um, wait a second. Does it, doesn't you have, don't you have to take into account, like, there's this positive person, and then they interacted with someone, and then that person interacted with me? That would actually cause me to potentially get infected from that. I mean, if it, if it was the other way around, if I interacted with that person, and then they interacted with the positive person, you're right. That doesn't mean that I'll get infected by that person. But that's not what we're trying to do. Actually, the goal of showing this distance as a radar is not to say that you're likely to catch that infection from that particular person. Instead, it's supposed to convey, convey lightning has struck close to you. You see, the way that we even figure out who's close to who is we actually even use more liberal measurements than just the six feet for 15 minutes. In fact, we use something like 30 feet for 15 minutes. But the goal of this is actually because we're trying to figure out anonymously who lives with who, who works with who, who hangs out with who, without knowing who the who's are. And at that point, we're just trying to tell you something like, COVID is striking at some point in your network, and the, the, the nearest strikes in your network are something like 10, 11, and 12 away. And actually, as we look at this graph, then we'll maybe be able to think about what does that matter to you, and that question you asked about time is going to play into it. So if we look at this, this chart, I'm curious, how would people respond if you saw this? What would you do if your chart looked like this? Feel free to unmute. Feel free to type anything. I'd probably stay at home. Stay at home. So there's a, different, there's a different variety of things, right? And everyone has the right to be different. Also, different people have different appetites for risk. And that's actually really important. And I see various people are saying they, are, they would be careful, or some other people say it seems far away. OK, I'm going to press play for a while. Suppose you, you see this. And by the way, it animates. The way it works in the app is it animates. Suppose it gets to there. Now I'm curious what, what people's reactions would be if you saw this. I still think it's pretty far away. I would, probably wouldn't change my behavior yet. OK. So seems like it's far away, wouldn't change your behavior, right? That, that's what some people say. Uh, the other people say a lot more, a little bit more concerned or a lot more concerned. My graph doesn't go far enough. But now, let's, let's just suppose. Suppose you saw that something hit at distance 3. What would you think? I'm actually curious, and there's no wrong answer here. I'm actually asking to find out. If you found that something hit at distance three, what would you do? Ah. I think I would be a lot more careful. So people are saying they would get tested or they'll get a bit more careful. By the way, remember my answer to that previous question was it does not mean that there was this chain of transmission that matches in time. But as you can see, it's still enough for you to know that there's like people that you hang out with who hang out with people who hang out with people who just got COVID. And so it's getting closer, right? And three, and so three is kind of the point. I see somebody said that three is kind of the point for that person to start getting worried or be more careful. What if you found out two? I'm actually curious now. Suppose it was at two. Very concerned. I see somebody else said, like, cut all ties, right? So people then get very concerned. But, but if you get very concerned, what would you do? Is there anything you can do? Get tested and quarantine. Stay at home. So notice that stay at home and quarantine are different things. 
quarantine is sort of like get locked at home by outside locking the door. But I think that that person's stay at home is locking the door from the inside, if you think about it. And I see people saying things like probably not go out. So now there's a reason why this is so, this is the paradigm shift. And actually for the Carnegie Mellon community, especially computer science background or math background, this is actually quite fun to think about. It's like, what's the difference between this paradigm and the standard paradigm? The difference is that the standard paradigm would be like me standing here and blocking everything except one, if you know what I mean. It's like the standard paradigm would be you only find out when something shows up at one. But when something shows up at one, it's actually too late if that makes sense. Showing up at one, there is not really a direct precautionary measure that you can take to protect yourself. But on the other hand, the reason why this is exciting is that you could then find out as it's coming, and before it actually gets to you, you have the power to do something about it. If you think about what life is like as, uh, under COVID, it is exactly like walking around blind. And this is radar. So we've actually invented radar for pandemics. And now the other reason I did all these polls to go and ask how people, do, how people would react is now you also got to hear how other people would react. You know, if this achieves just one thing called whenever COVID strikes within distance three of a person, they start to freak out. And when it hits distance two, they really freak out. And then they stay at home. What's this going to do to the spread of COVID? it's going to slow it. Some people say stop, some people say slow. But do you see the exact behaviors that one would take because they don't want themselves to get sick will actually dynamically cause the spread of COVID to shrink wherever it is. Okay, so, so that's, 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 like, that's like the heart of that, right? That's the heart of this. It's, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift. This is what we've made. We've made this here, uh, here uh, made this here out of the CMU community. And I'm very happy to be able to talk about this, guy, this with you guys. Hopefully now you also understand the principle of this. In fact, our goal here is not actually just to protect Carnegie Mellon. It's to change the way all of humanity responds to pandemics forever by saying there's now a way to do it with radar. But now this is supposed to be a technical talk too. So we've spent 15 minutes talking about like what it does. Oh, question, question, curious. I'm sorry, every time someone types in the Zoom, I have to go forward. Can, would you be willing to just unmute your mic and say it? That will just be more fun. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I was just curious how big degree 12 is going to be. Like if you assume that every person like knows two new people, that it's like pretty exponential. So. Would we just start off with five plus for degree 12? Yes, that's a fantastic question. So the point is it's going to grow exponentially. And at degree 12, I mean, come on, the number of people that will be at degree 12 once this is actually being used in, in like an entire city, you'll have like tens of thousands of your people at, de at degree 12. Of course, it'll be five plus. And this is where I'm going to share. You know, we have a lot of computer science people here. I also have computer science background. I have learned to have enormous respect for user experience designers the Human Computer Interaction Institute, anyone who wants to do HCI, you guys are awesome. And by the way, that's why it caps at five plus. Do you know what this chart is trying to do? This chart is just trying to make people freak out. They won't get freaked out if the, if the chart axis at distance 12 is like, you know, that's the high. If we did it without this truncation at five, and it was like, the height is the height. You know, at distance 12, maybe like there's 100 people. And then everyone will be like, oh, come on. There's like one puny person who got into distance two. I don't need to scare, get scared. But because we care about the user experience design and how humans respond psychologically to stuff like this, we capped it at five. When it's capped at five, if there's one unit over here, you see it. So the answer to your question is yes, absolutely. The, the 12 thing would be like, it should be through the roof. But we just don't, we don't want people to think that that means the rest of them don't mean anything. Are there other questions about this? Um, yes. How are you... Um, as how are you figuring out the, the um, how far people are away? I mean, is it only for app users, or do you have some way of estimating it for people off of the app or for correcting for that somehow? Cool. So the question is, how do you find out how far away people are? And I want to make sure I talk about some tech here too, right? So this is fun. This is actually done using Android and iOS things. Um, for all of you who are doing anything which involves programming, I want to encourage that even if you are a theorist, to at some point really get your hands dirty. In fact, I'm a very, I'm, I'm, I'm like officially a theorist, right? I'm even in the math department. But I will say I've actually written a decent number of the lines of the Android code and the iOS code that are in the app, Novid, if you download it. 
Um, but what I was writing is I was writing the parts that are doing some of that sensing and some of the algorithms. So in particular, it's doing a few things. And the first thing it's doing for anyone using the app is it uses the Wi-Fi access point to figure out which two devices were on the same Wi-Fi access point at the same time. That's the first thing that we say, because that one works for all devices, iOS and Android. And for anyone here who's more on the math side, I will say that if you have a math background, you get very good at trying to figure out you know, what are all the rules in your system, and then find out how to get what you want subject to the rules. That's actually math. <laughs> That's what we do in math. And so the rules in what you're allowed to do in an iPhone make it so you can't do many things when your app is backgrounded, when it's not on the main screen. So in fact, what, you're, what we do is we use one of the things we're allowed to do on the iPhone, which is to check which Wi-Fi, not network, but which Wi-Fi base station we're connected to. Every base station, every, every access point transmitter has actually an, a fingerprint. And so we're able to check which fingerprint is it, and we check whether or not two devices are on the same one, and we see if they're on the same one for an extended period of time. But wait, since again I'm talking to the CMU computer science and math audience, here's another fun thing. We don't want to keep that fingerprint for privacy reasons. So we actually care about privacy. The entire purpose of this was to make a way in order to help keep people safe while also help keep them uh, not feeling creeped out. I just told you every access point has a fingerprint. It would be kind of creepy if what we were doing is we were saying, well, here's this user ID, and they were just on this access point with a fingerprint. Because then we'd know a lot about them, right? We don't want that. So I'm happy to share some things that you can do to make sure that you don't have both of those pieces of information at the same time. This is where you also think, in mathematics, there's an area of math called algebra. Algebra is where you study about things called groups. I don't need anything that fancy here. In computer science, in theoretical computer science, there's a much more advanced area of research that does this. I think it's called something like homomorphic encryption. But if I want to say it in a simple way, all I care about is I want to know whether two devices were on the same fingerprint at the same time. But I don't care what that fingerprint is. How to do it? I'll share with you what we do. What we do is we actually keep another server. And that server only does one job. Maybe I should just write instead of just drawing with, uh, making motions with my hands. So I'm just going to draw on this, uh, on this mini chalkboard I've got here. Right? So what we do is we have this fingerprint, right? We have this fingerprint, but we don't want to store the fingerprint. So we have a server, a server for which what we do is we send it the fingerprint, this is the Wi-Fi fingerprint, Wi-Fi access point fingerprint. And what the server spits out and comes back to us, oop, that's strange. Looks like my, my drawing program just glitched. Hang on a second. Now you'll see how the drawing program is made. Uh, just a second. Always use Linux. Then when things crash, you can just get it back. Okay, so we got this Wi-Fi access point, and what the Wi-Fi access point sends back is it sends back, um, I'll call it a temporary identifier. And what's actually on the server? What's on the server is a hash table. So on, on the server, there's a hash table that goes from, oh wait, I need to write the word fingerprint, which goes from the fingerprint to random. Well, I'll call it to identifier. I'm going to pause for a second and just ask, does what I'm saying make sense? I'm saying that I don't ever want to store the actual fingerprint in our database. So what we do is we have a completely separate server where you can throw at the server as many fingerprints as you want. The server keeps a random hash table where it takes fingerprints and it stores identifiers. But these identifiers change every 30 minutes. Change randomly every 30 minutes. 
So now since it's changing randomly every 30 minutes, what happens? Suppose I've got two phones which are on the same Wi-Fi network. Uh, sorry, on the same Wi-Fi access point. They both go and ask, hey, what's the temporary identifier corresponding to this fingerprint? When they ask, they don't tell the server who they are. They're just like, hi, I, I, I'm on this thing. What's the, what's, what's the temporary thing right now for that fingerprint? And out comes an identifier. And that's actually what they then store on the main server. Did this make sense? I just want to double check if this made sense. Hacker Po. <laughs> well, well, this is the exact opposite, right? The, the point is, if you do this, you don't actually need to have any database which has both the user ID and the fingerprint at the same time. Because since it changes every 30 minutes, well then, you can check equality, right? If you, if you want to check the equality, then that's good enough. Ooh, questions. Actually, could you just uh, s uh, speak it out? I see that somebody is saying something. His name starts with a C. Sorry, it's just really loud in my apartment right now. Uh, I'm basically asking if Novid was a malicious app, would you guys be able? If we were a malicious app, would we? Uh, legal limits of dealing with this type of information. I, oh, I'm sorry. I actually didn't understand your question. So I'm going to read what it says. OK. So if we were a malicious app, would we, get, would we be able to store and save this information if we wanted to? Ah, yes, 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 yes. OK. So actually, if your question is, are we even allowed to have a server that takes fingerprints? Well, so let me tell you about why it's not good for us to have the fingerprint together with your user ID. And that's why we don't do it. The reason is because there was another CMU student. Uh, he, he's amazing. He helped, he helped work with us. He's, he's actually like a pretty good hacker. And he told us, you know, if you had the fingerprints, you could know where the people are. Because there's a database of for every fingerprint where it is geographically. And I, I mean, I went afterwards and hunted about this. It's true. It turns out that the Google Street View cars, you know, like there's Google Street View, right? The Google Street View cars, while they were driving around, they weren't only taking pictures of the sidewalks and the storefronts. They were also recording all of the fingerprints that they passed by. Fingerprints are, pa are, are, are fingerprints of the Wi-Fi access points. And the reason every Wi-Fi access point has a fingerprint is because that's the only way you can communicate with it. It's, it's like, I want to talk to that Wi-Fi access point. It has to have a fingerprint. But as you're driving by, you can also find all of their fingerprints. By the way, these are all called BSS IDs for anyone here who likes technical things. These are all BSS IDs. So in fact, legally, uh, there's already a giant company which has a big database of every single BSS ID that they could get their hands on and where it is geographically. So if the question was like, are we operating within the legal limits? Um, yes, we actually are trying to be even more respectful. And if the question is, oh, but what if we're malicious in the sense that, what if we're actually secretly also sending the user ID you know, over to here too? Maybe we could be. Well, the way we deal with that is actually any place that we're working with. For example, Georgia Tech was one of the first universities that we launched at. We actually said, OK, if you're willing to review the source code, I mean, not if you're willing to, you can review the source code if you want under NDA, just so that you don't like post it there and then everyone else copies it and, and whatever. We're like, yeah, you know, we got no skeletons in the closet. If you want to see the source code, you can see the source code. And the Georgia Tech analysis at that time so it was like they didn't see anything funny at that time in, in what they were looking at. That's all I can say. And of course, if we're working with a regional government, like a state, we have the same, the same offer. But the point was to make it so that what ends up in the database that we keep, so ultimately, what do we keep in the database? We just keep the user ID, which is a random number that's generated, together with the temporary identifier. And that serves the purpose of checking if they're equal, right? Well, almost. It doesn't. There is an edge case. Can anyone tell me what would be bad about this setup? If I'm trying to have something where there's this temporary thing which is random and it rotates every half hour, um, and I want to see if two people are on the same Wi-Fi, and I, I, I'm willing to say like at the same time means within you know three minutes of each other or something, where does this break? Ah, it changes between checks. But there's a way to solve it. The way we do it is it changes between checks, and the temporary identifier is actually what we call token, I can't spell, token one, token two. There are two temporary identifiers. Can anyone tell me what you would do? If it, why, why, why do I have two random IDs? Why do I have two?
Token 1 is the previous. Exactly. What happens when you rotate? When you rotate, what this means is that you change from something like, if it was something like hi, bye, then that would turn into something like yo and hi, or something like that. Does that make sense? You just kind of rotate the other one across. At this point, it's good. It's going to survive overlaps, and we're good. Communicate both at the same time, change after every 15 minutes. Right. Concurrency and communication would, have been making, would make our life easier, except that actually, since I'm talking about this very computer science -y stuff, it's very practical, it's actually very hard to synchronize clocks. In the math world and in the physics world, you can say that these are massless strings and these are happening concurrently and this is the exact distance, but for computers to synchronize clocks is actually non-trivial. And if you really wanted to synchronize even to like one millisecond, that's actually a hard problem to do. So this thing actually solves it. So this is like some of the under the hood stuff. And this is how do we manage to handle the Wi-Fi in a way where we don't actually need to know the actual fingerprint and store it onto the server. So we were very happy to make this. Now, the next thing is that we, we, we don't only use Wi-Fi. We also will use Bluetooth. Uh, actually, if you have a phone, and if it's an Android phone, every seven to eight minutes, you're able to go and check to go and see if there are any nearby devices based on Bluetooth. And if we find there's a nearby device, then they actually communicate over Bluetooth briefly and exchange their random IDs and say, OK, you were around. Now, at that point, I said Android devices can go and broadcast and look anytime that they want. iPhones can't always go and check, which is why we have this thing for iPhones. I mean, this thing supports everything. The, the Wi-Fi supports everything. But for the Bluetooth, what happens is anyone who has an Android phone runs around, and they're helping to form these links, because iPhones will respond if an Android asks. Androids are able to scan and say, is there anything around? iPhones just can't do that, just can't do their own scan. But because of that Bluetooth check, then if an Android is around, we can go and find out that there was some other iPhone which was nearby. And then if it's an, if it's an Android talking to an Android, actually they do one more step. They use ultrasound. They agree that, OK, I'm going to make a noise. And then we measure how long it takes for that noise to get to the other side. And we multiply that by the speed of sound. So it's three things. OK, I want to hit some more questions that popped in here. Uh, is there somebody with an A name, which I can't read? <laughs> Do you want to say, say your question out loud? Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, like, you said that you can send out, like, frequent Bluetooth signals, but does that drain the energy on the device itself? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is not significantly. And the reason is because uh, it's all. this is what you think about when you think about order of magnitudes. Actually, this is a really useful thing if you're learning in your classes of, like, how to estimate back of the envelope calculations or to think in an order of magnitude way. Here's how you do it. The Bluetooth scan is actually only happening every seven to eight minutes. And every seven to eight minutes, then it does a scan, and the scan takes 10 seconds to go and say, is there anything nearby? That's the high power part of the scan. So if you think about it, even though you're scanning, because most of the time you're not scanning, it actually won't take a huge fraction of your, of your power. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank yeah. You. And that's, that's like how we often think of it whenever we're making all of these things. We're like, what's the order of magnitude? And if something is happening only a tiny fraction of the time, it won't hurt you very much. You would, we, I only get scared when there's something that starts to happen in a continuous way, because then it's going to eat CPU and battery all the way through. Cool. I also saw that somebody, somebody made a comment on the YouTube channel about iPhones are worse than Androids. I, I, that's not true. I'm not here to make a value judgment. It's just that there are different security rules when you work with each of the devices. And if you hear how I talked through this, it's almost like a logic problem. Uh, I see some more questions that came in. Does somebody want to unmute and say their question? It'll be, it'll be fun. Yeah. Um, so I have Novit on my iPhone, and I noticed that like if I turn my Bluetooth off for a sec, like, and I, it like asks me to turn the Bluetooth on. So are you using the Bluetooth on the iPhone for something else, or why is it asking if it's not actually using it? Oh, cool. So we, we, we want the Bluetooth to be on. If the Bluetooth is off, you'll actually still be able to use this thing, this Wi-Fi thing. But if the Bluetooth is on, and somebody walks by with an Android, walks by meaning you hang out with them with an Android, then in fact, it's more efficient for them to directly find out that you were nearby. You see, if you have the Wi-Fi link, we actually want a few hours of being on the same Wi-Fi link, Wi-Fi access point, before we conclude you were together, because you have long range on the Wi-Fi. 
Bluetooth is short range. And it only takes 15 minutes for us to declare that somebody was close to someone else if they linked up with Bluetooth, as opposed to several hours with Wi-Fi. So if you have your Bluetooth on, it means that your iPhone will respond if an Android showed up. And that will make it more convenient for you. Actually, there's something else you can do too. On the iPhones, if you, if you are going to some event that's outside, and if you actually want to be able to get connected up with them, you can go into something called standby mode in the app. And if you just press the standby mode button, then in fact, your, and your iPhone starts having the full functionality of the Androids. Uh, it's just that then it's, it's, it's on your screen, if that makes sense. And so depending on how risky you think the climate is, like if you saw a very, very bad climate, you might actually want to. And the, the, our, our entire point was to make it so that these are all optional things that you can put on. Oh, one more thing I want to say, because especially if you use an iPhone, you will notice that we ask for your location preferences. Or we'll ask for your location permissions. And we also seem to, the app keeps asking for location permissions. And you might say, wait, does that mean that we're using the GPS? The answer is no, we actually aren't using the GPS. But the getting the BSS ID is actually a location call. You need to have location permissions in an iPhone app in order to do this. And the reason you need to is because there are people who have databases that take this and give a G not a GPS, but give like a latitude longitude. So we don't use it for that. We just use this to run through this thing, which then gives us back garbage. But I mean, not every app maker might do that. And so that's why the Apple, the Apple uh, rules are that if you want to get this, you have to get location permissions. I have a quick question. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm not really well versed in, in all this talk about Wi-Fi and stuff. So I was just wondering, like, lots of times my phone isn't connected to like Wi-Fi, but it's connected to like LTE or 4G. And is that um, is there any like distinction there and any obstacles you have to kind of overcome? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So. Uh, Wi-Fi is actually yes, it's the it's the actual Wi-Fi. It, it's not using your cellular connection. So you, basically your phone has the capability of talking to other phones by connecting to the cell towers, which are very far away. And Wi-Fi is a short range communication where it can go through that Wi-Fi access point and then get onto the internet right away. So for our Wi-Fi detection system, you actually have to be connected to Wi-Fi. So you have to set up your phone so that it automatically connects to Wi-Fi whenever it is around a Wi-Fi uh, access point, which on campus there's tons of. And now what you're getting at is something which is showing that there are also times that this app doesn't detect, right? If you, well, if you have an iPhone, there are times that it won't detect. And then you might ask, what's the point of that? Well, the reason why it's actually OK is because we're not trying to quarantine people, right? We're not trying to use this to drive quarantine. If we were using this to drive quarantine, we'd, be get, we'd get very scared of the fact that we're missing people because we should have quarantined some more people. Instead, we're just trying to spread this warning signal. And if you're trying to spread the warning signal, if sometimes you don't actually link up, but you link up with someone else, you'll still see the warning signal, but the warning signal might be a little bit farther away from you than it really is. And that brings me to a point that I need to say, which is if you use Novid and you see that the coast is clear, it does not mean that the coast is clear. It just means that there's nobody that was detected. The best analogy is it's like when you drive, there's this mirror on the other side of the car called the passenger side mirror. And it has a sign that says objects in mirror are closer than they appear. And that's the best way to think about Novit. If we tell you that we detected a path of distance like of length five between you and the positive case, it could be that there's a shorter path. But it is true that there's a path of length five. And there are also blind spots. Just like if you're driving, you can't just go and merge into the other lane just because you don't see anything in that mirror. However, our goal is that, as we're doing this here at, at, at all of the places that we're deploying this, um, our goal is to have you know, ideally as many people involved with this as possible, and then that, that will strengthen everybody's radar. OK. I'm just going to switch back to here so I don't have this strange dark background. Are there any other questions right here before we continue? Uh, I had a question about how you were using ultrasound. You said you were using it to like get the distance, but what are you doing with the distance information then? Ah, so. Actually, that's where our part of quarantine comes in. We actually also will tell you if you've been around somebody who's positive and then, and then tell you, hey, you've been around someone positive, so maybe you'll need to, maybe it's a good idea to quarantine. Now, we only want to tell you that if we're sure. 
And so the ultrasound is used to actually measure the distance because Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are kind of wide ranging things. And in fact, there's nobody in the entire world who has yet managed to make a, a Bluetooth based distance measurement. But we have a wife, we have, sorry, we have an ultrasonic based distance measurement. So we measure that and then we go and use that to, to tell you to quarantine only if you've actually been close to somebody. And there's another reason we're measuring the distance. It's because if you think about what computers can do, there's a lot you can do with data, machine learning, statistics. And we're actually collecting a lot of correlations between Wi between not Wi-Fi, between uh, Bluetooth signal strengths, ultrasonic distance measurements, and so on, so that we eventually will be able to use all this to, in fact, even infer a distance more accurately, guessing distances based on other measurements that we've used. Why is this important? The reason this is important is because I didn't start this just to make an app. In fact, I didn't want to just make an app. I started this because my area of research is network theory, and the idea was you should be able to use network theory to control pandemics. So we need to find a way to get this anonymous network to do something with. The only problem is how do you get the network? I guess that means we've got to make an app. Otherwise, we won't have the network, right? So it's like, yes, we want to save the world through the network. How to get the network? I guess the first thing is to make an app. Oh, we just have to make an app that everyone uses. So that became the, the, what we have to do next. So, so we did this, and that's what we're working on right now. Before we go on to more questions, I want to make a fun comment because this is also something about algorithms. Again, I, I know that a lot of people here are in these uh, technical classes. You know, I showed you this graph earlier. So I'm just going back here. I showed you this chart earlier. Oh, what just happened? Oh, I just found out that my computer has, a, has apparently run out of battery, but that's okay. I already showed you the main stuff. So, um, so uh, back to that chart I showed you earlier where it was showing you how many positive cases were at each distance. Here's where computational complexity comes in. It's really annoying. How do you make an algorithm that if there are n people would tell you for each of those n people, not tell you, we have to do, we have to do the whole computation on a server. We have to do a big computation so that for each of the n people, they know how far away all of the other cases are from them. Actually, if you don't do it right, that can be a quadratic time algorithm. It's somewhat related to Dijkstra's algorithm. I'm not sure if these are things you've learned already in 251, I'm guessing, maybe, like graph, graph algorithms. Um, but it's somehow, if you wanted to know for a particular vertex how far away the other vertices are, it could take you a while. It could actually be quadratic. Or at least it could be like, yeah, yeah, it could, it could be something like quadratic. Now, if n is a billion, this is a big problem. right? We were trying to make something that you could use for the world. You can't run a quadratic time algorithm efficiently. That, 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 I don't mean efficiently. You can't run it fast enough in order to serve all these people unless you have a bazillion computers. So that actually brings into another area. There's an area of research which is called approximation algorithms. And I understand that you might even touch on some of these in 251, where you say, is it really that important to know that the number of cases at distance 10 from you is 73? Maybe you don't need to know it's 73. Maybe if you just like, I don't know, it's like 70-ish. That's good enough. Do you know what I mean? So the, the idea here was you can actually use approximations to significantly reduce the work you're doing. And just in a nutshell, if I want to share with you like roughly what we're doing, what we're doing is we actually estimate how many people there are at each distance from you, and those are just estimates. But the way that we make the estimates is that the estimates are always, um, they're always under, do I want to say that? No, no, I, I want to say that like this. If there is anyone, we always detect it. So if there's anyone, we show at least one. But the exact number might not be exactly right. Actually, it's better than that. As long as the number is less than mm, probably something around like 10 to 20, it's actually on the dot. But once the number gets bigger, then the approximation starts to fall off. So I just wanted to share that. It's like if you, ever, if you ever find yourself trying to make an app and you might have to deal with n equals a billion um, and you find out that you're using a quadratic time algorithm, a very good idea might be to ask yourself, is it permissible to make the app so that it doesn't go and use the quadratic time by just returning something that's approximate instead? And so uh, that's, a, that's a note to like, 
pay attention when you're learning about all these different algorithms, because if you know what you're allowed to flex on, you can sometimes get things done much more quickly. OK, there's a question already. Uh, Chris, do you want to just unmute and say it? I can't read. Do the um, approximations compound by degree 12? What's the error? Mm. OK, so actually the way the approximations work is we estimate how many are there at distance up to d. So we actually don't, there's not a really good efficient algorithm to find out exactly how many positives are at distance exactly d. But there is, a, there is an efficient way to find out how many positives are at distance less than or equal to d. And then we have an estimate which might be good up to some multiplicative approximation. And OK, then the part that's not as good is we just subtract. We go and say, OK, how many are at exactly d? It's the number that are at most d minus the number at d minus 1. And there you might get some errors. But at least the cumulative, if you add them all up from distance 1, 2, 3 up to d, that should be about right. I see there's another question that asked about algorithms are using for approximation. OK, it turns out it's related to something called Bloom filters, which I understand that sometimes in 451 you cover. Uh, but roughly speaking, it's like this. Suppose, suppose I'm trying to figure out how many things there are at a particular distance. I need to I need to do some iterative process. So I, I kind of go iteration by iteration, and it's like I just figured out how many things are in distance less than or equal to 5 from me. Suppose I knew that. Suppose I knew for every vertex how many other infected things, uh, positive things, are at distance at most 5 from them. Well then, here's a dumb thing you could do. You could say, here's a vertex. I want to know how many positives there are at distance at most 6 from me. It's easy. I just go and look at all of my friends. And I ask each of them, how many positives are at distance at most 5 from you, from you, from you, from you? And I add up those numbers. Well, that's actually really lousy. You, over, you, put, you could overcount. Because what might happen is that you might, I mean, maybe this person says there's 10 people at distance at most 5 from me. This person says there's 5 people at distance at most 5 from me. But what if those two overlap? It's not fair to say then there's at most 15 people at distance at most 6 from me. Right? So actually, this all boils down to a question of set union. And what we do is we use, we use, we use some hash tables. And if, you, if you're curious, if you just Google for Bloom filter, you'll learn a little bit about what you can do with like, trying to figure out whether, whether things are in sets or, or if you want to find some kind of a set, set union type algorithm where it's approximate. Because we, we can't just go and add those numbers. We have to somehow union the sets in a, in a certain way. But it, it, it ends up using like probability as well. It's actually a lot of fun. So I just wanted to throw that out, just to show you that somehow what's under the hood in here is actually a combination of lots of things. There's, of course, the hacking part of like figuring out what can you do with an with a iPhone or an Android, what's the most that you can do. There's also this part of, oh, can we afford to run all the servers? Well, that becomes these algorithms that you're learning about. Uh, and of course, there's this question of how do you protect privacy? Uh, effectively, what we wanted to set up is some kinds of bijections, uh, but bijections into random numbers. And, and so that, that's what was there, too. And so that there's all of this stuff, actually, that went into it because we were building from scratch a new technology. And at this point, it is the only technology in the entire world which delivers a COVID radar. And so I also want to say, another piece I need to say, uh, of course, this is voluntary for people to download. We hope that you think that this is interesting and that we hope at least you understand what it does. But I want to give a warning. You see, when Elon Musk launches rockets, they don't always work. Sometimes they, sometimes they blow up, but it's OK. Somehow, well, it's not really OK. It's just that there aren't really any other rockets. There are some, well, there are some other rockets, but there aren't, uh, we were paying attention to these because these are some of our, our best hopes. And so what I want to emphasize, whoa, Bloom filter is covered by 122. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Somebody else said Android phones have been known to blow up. Blow up. We will not make your phone blow up. That is not what I meant. <laughs> but, but, but what I mean is that um, if you're joining this, you will notice that there's just constant work being done to it in the sense that the user interface will change, usually improve. The sensing will improve. Oh my gosh, we just released you know, a new thing on Wi-Fi. Is this just for two, one, 251 people, or is it for every class? Say again, please. I'm so sorry. I accidentally unmuted. 
Oh, I don't mind. It's, it was more fun that you did. <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm not talking to a dark room of names written, plastered onto like rectangles. Okay, so <laughs> I, I don't mind. But but what I mean is, uh, what I was getting at is, uh, if the app is, uh, if the app ever does something that's weird, we actually want to ask you, we want to request to you, please write to us, write to the feedback, because what you are part of, anyone who joins this, is actually a pioneer along a project that is trying to change the way that the entire world deals with pandemics forever. If we prove that this works, which is what we're doing here, if we prove that this works by helping CMU make it all the way through Thanksgiving without having to shut down and everyone going home without getting your parents sick, this will be a huge case that would be potentially causing a lot of other universities, a lot of other regions to switch to this different paradigm and possibly reverse the spread of COVID. I see that there was some question. So oh, people are discussing whether or not bloom filters were here, which is cool. Yes, false positives. Oh, oh, I see. People are talking about people are talking about all of this, uh, all of, all of these algorithms. It's cool. Yeah. So, so we, we do want to say, you know, like what what you have here, it is something that is constantly being fine tuned, constantly being improved. But everyone who joins this thing is actually contributing to what hopefully is going to change history. And I'm really happy that you guys came to this talk to be able to discuss what this does, because hopefully now everyone has a has an impression of what this is about. This is about COVID radar. This is about a totally different way that you could fight pandemics. We're trying to prove to the entire world that this is the way, the way. And if you think about what advantages it has, it's huge. Quarantine is the only other thing we know. And in fact, I understand that there are places which are shutting down at this point because the, the, the COVID is getting out of control. The difference between this and quarantine and mass shutdown is that this is focused. So when we focus this thing, now, now you conceivably can have only certain places doing this thing. And also with quarantine, if you think about quarantine, quarantine is not super fair either. Only certain people have the liberty that they can work from home while under quarantine. So these are all things that we think about. I see some more questions. Let's finish the rest of this last few minutes with random questions. Uh, I see something about Bluetooth security. Is that right? Well, I can read that one. The question is, how secure is Bluetooth? We were trying to figure that out too. So we were trying to figure that out too. It appears that Bluetooth does do some kind of encryption if you, if you choose the right parameters. But our idea was that we, we were going to assume that it wasn't secure. So we were going to assume that with Bluetooth, somebody else might reverse engineer our app and make something else to go and listen to it. So in fact, when you're walking around and you're broadcasting things with Bluetooth, we're not even having you send your actual user ID. We also make random user IDs. Sorry, we call them alter egos. So you have a user ID for you, and we actually call it in the code base alter ego. You've got all these alter egos, and your alter egos keep changing. And so when somebody else contacts you with Bluetooth and says, hey, who are you? You respond with a temporary alter ego. And the person's like, great, I just met Jimmy. And they have no idea who you are. But it's, I just met, uh, sorry, I just made something up. It's not Jimmy. It's a 128-bit UUID, if that means anything to you. But it's some enormous random number, okay? And now, um, the, the point of having this alter ego is that even if somebody else eavesdropped, it's like, I don't know, who is this person? And the, 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 the alter ego is going to change soon anyway. And then what we do is securely, your, the phone sends its actual user ID and the alter ego it just used into the server. That's secure. That's running over HTTPS. It's, a, it's a security on the internet. And we, we send that through a secure channel into our server. Nobody else can eavesdrop on that. And then somehow our server knows that your real user ID is this, and you just communicated by this alter ego. So we, that's, that's what we do. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty paranoid of a lot of the different things that are here. And so we just try to, we try to use minimal, uh, we try to leak minimal information as we go. Other questions? Yeah, real quick. It seems like something like this is pretty dependent on like a lot of people using it. What are some plans and things that you're thinking about to scale the usage of the app? Yeah. So one of the things was to give a talk to all of you guys here. <laughs> that was one of the things. But, but, but because what, here's what we've noticed. We've noticed that the vast majority of CMU students don't know the power of what the app can do for you. The, the vast majority of CMU students only know that the app is able to tell you if you've been around somebody who has COVID and then maybe it'll ask you to quarantine, which is actually the least exciting thing. In fact, I've barely even talked about that today. And so 
we have found that if you make an app that legitimately delivers value to someone, the chance that they install it goes up significantly. You see, if I want to compare, the old paradigm was an app that will protect other people from you. This is an app that protects you from other people. We mathematicians like to think about what's commutative and what's not. And so once you flip that, since it's not commutative, it's fundamentally different. And we have noticed that as soon as people find out, if they start to think rationally about it, a decent number of them actually install it because it will help them avoid getting infected, avoid having to quarantine and so on. Now, I do want to emphasize one more thing. I mean, we are in a state, Pennsylvania, where there is an official app that's doing the other thing. So I want to emphasize, go and install that too. You can, in fact, install both at the same time. They don't conflict with each other. And in terms of battery usage, again, each is like a very small slice in terms of only actually activating very infrequently. So I want to make that statement just so that it's clear. I'm not saying that don't use the PA app. Go ahead and use the PA app also, right? But in terms of the adoption, what we've been doing is at Carnegie Mellon, we actually have now talked to a lot of the people who are running the uh, residential system, as well as a lot of house fellows and RAs and CAs. Uh, we're now talking to all of you. We're trying to help everyone understand what's going on. Oh my gosh, I just remembered something else that we did. Yeah, this was advised by one of our designers. We also have food discounts. So, so somebody advised us that the, the easiest way to make an app take off in the student community was to make sure that there are food discounts. Uh, so in fact, what we did is we, we went and found another problem where we can do a win-win solution. The restaurants around CMU are suffering. Local businesses are suffering because of the pandemic. And we realized that if you make it so that the restaurants work with us and then there are discounts for people who are using the app, then more people might also want to use the app because then they also get discounts from restaurants. The restaurants are happy because even the discounted meal, they make a profit on. And also what they're hoping is that you like it and you go back, right? In fact, it was such a win-win that the restaurants even asked us how much it costs for, us to, for them to put it on. And that's when we kind of scratched our heads and said, we actually didn't think about that. There's no cost. It's just free. Because here we're just trying to help, uh, help the whole situation. So that's another strategy for adoption. This is all CMU specific. Our real strategy for adoption in the wider world is that we want to prove that this, in fact, works. <laughs> Somebody said, charge them a dollar. Well, I mean, again, we don't, we're not interested in that. I, I'm a social entrepreneur, so that's actually th not what I'm interested in here. But the real goal is to demonstrate that this, oh, wow, somebody else said, then they might think it's legit. You know, that's really funny. Um, it's really funny. If something is free, most people think it's not legit. We found this out the hard way. At the very beginning, when we were making this app, we found out that somehow people just thought that we weren't legit because we were free. And it is still free. And that's actually one reason why this is so important. I should actually say, I mean, eventually when universities are working with us and we actually provide a lot of services to other universities and so on, it's actually not completely free for the university. However, I want to emphasize one reason why what, what, what we're trying to use is we're trying to use science. So the question is like, what does it mean to be considered legit? One way to be considered legit is it costs enough. Another way to be considered legit is it's just better science. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to drive the science point. And that's, in fact, what everyone is now part of. Cool. Did that help to answer your question about the adoption? Yeah, for sure. That was great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for asking, too. And of course, one of the things that we hope is that since you guys heard all of this, we hope that you will also help to share with other people who you see. Again, because actually there's a self-interest in this. If you have the app and other people around you have the app, it actually makes you safer. And it just makes everyone safer. So that's what we hope. And our real hope with adoption is after proving that this is the, this is actually the only solution I know of in the entire world that could try to stop the spread of COVID. If we manage to do that, then we'll actually be a lot easier to, to put out in lots of other places. Cool. Oh yes, a very important thing. Somebody said that if you if you if you if you're downloaded that if you're downloading this thing, right? Um, do join the Carnegie Mellon community. Uh, to join the Carnegie Mellon community. There is a, there's a code that you can use that you can type in. It's Tartans, T-A-R-T-A-N-S. So please do type that in to join the CMU community because that will also show you the local, the local discounts that are specific to CMU. COVID itself is evolving too. Oh yeah, that's right. That's what I'm scared of. I should also say, you know, why am I wasting all my time doing this? Wasting meaning like, why am I spending huge amounts of time to try to stop this? A lot of people are saying, look, there'll be a vaccine. Someone else will do it. 
I'll tell you something from my own experience. So I work, I'm a researcher. I've been talking to a lot of other people who are very talented and like could do things. And the thing that has made me very concerned is a lot of people that I, you know, that, that are very, very good have the attitude that, you know, not the attitude that, that's not, I don't want to say they have a bad attitude. I just want to say, don't have a direct thing that they could immediately do. But unfortunately, there's an idea that somebody else is going to solve the problem in the sense that maybe the vaccine will show up and it will get solved. In my opinion, we shouldn't count on the vaccine being a silver bullet. I'm not ready to say that the moment the vaccine comes, the world will magically be good. I think that's actually wishful thinking. So that's why it's even more important that whatever we're doing here, we actually take some action to try to stop the problem. Or else, what will it be? Maybe a year later we find out vaccine showed up and it still didn't solve the problem. Is that the right time to start? Not really. So what we are doing here on this team is we're really trying to keep coming up with a different solution that could solve the problem. And because we persevered for the last seven months, we actually managed to get to this point where it happens to be, you know, I can't tell you it's perfect, but I can tell you it is the most effective in the entire world. Whoa, cool. I see that Dean DeJour is here. I'm just going to give a shout out to Dean DeJour since I saw that he posted this thing in there. Dean DeJour was the first person to join this project. At that time, he was a Carnegie Mellon senior. And he has been one of the key people who has helped to build the design and also the engineering inside this project. So um, whatever you're using, you're using the work, the hard work of many people who are from this community. With that, I've actually officially hit the end of the time. Um, officially, it's over. Uh, I hope that you guys had something, got something out of this, whether it was like scientific, mathematical, computer, or, enter or just entertainment. Um, but I, I will say I'm happy to stick around if people have like some random other questions. But officially, it's over. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, I also want to emphasize, like, we actually have like an incredible team on this that helped to build this. It's actually not just the one person I shouted out to. Like this thing would not exist without this entire team with lots and lots of people who are from CMU. There was even an article on the CMU website about this. And that's what can happen. And I'm, I'm really, really happy and proud of what this community can make. Thank you. And if people want to ask random questions, so feel free to just unmute. I'll stick around. I don't have anything after this. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, Something I saw on the App Store reviews was like, um, people are annoyed that you have to keep the app on in order for it to work. Is there anything that you guys are working on to sort of get around that aspect of like UI, I guess? Oh my gosh, I should have said at the beginning, we don't need to do that. So you don't need to do that anymore. That's very powerful. So th that's, why, that's why I was talking about the Wi-Fi sensing. If what you're using the app for is that you want the super accurate uh, distance measurements, then you need to keep the app on. But at this point, because of the Wi-Fi system, if you just install the app and just like open it every day or two, maybe even to look at the discounts or to look at the graph, that just is enough to keep the app alive and not kicked out of the, kicked out of the RAM. So now it's, now it's way, way, way easier. I'm also happy to say the reason why we were able to do that is because of the paradigm shift. So the, the, the fact that we are more interested in trying to figure out you know, which devices are around which other devices for an extended amount of time, that's all you need to build the backbone of this network. And for that, the Wi-Fi is enough. Whereas uh, all of the other groups which were trying to do this in the world, they were not going for that paradigm. They were going for the paradigm of telling people to quarantine and isolate. For that, they needed to have very accurate measurements, which still are hard for them to do. But then they couldn't use Wi-Fi. So that's the difference. Oh, cool. Somebody just asked the question, was this recorded? And the answer is yes, Zoom automatically records. So there is a recording of this. And, um, and yes, I would be, hmm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to share this. Maybe I'll communicate with the other professors who helped to make this happen. And, and if, if, if you guys are, are curious, you can get it from them. Feel free to just unmute and ask. Um, hello? Yeah. So I was wondering if you guys send out like notifications to users in order to sort of like incentivize that they keep the app in RAM. Because um, I remember downloading it like a couple months ago and then I just kind of like forgot it existed. Yes. So uh, we are actually working on this actively right now in the sense that 
as the red things get closer to you, we might send you a notification to be like, hey, it changed. Or maybe we'll send you something of like, you got something closer in your network. But then again, you're also saying if you just haven't had it open. Well, that's actually where we thought about the, um, that's where we thought of the restaurant discounts. It's like, we actually can send a notification being like, hey, new discount. And we hope that that would help you know to open the app as well as maybe give you something to eat. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah, sure. There's something else that you can also do, which is that we made it so that if you go to the app and, and click on the CMU, if you're in the CMU community, you click on the CMU, um, you can also take your daily symptom survey from there. I mean, of course, you already get an email about it, but if there's like something you can click on and that goes to the daily symptom survey point uh, to take the daily symptom survey. But of course, this is not, I, I don't mean like just use the app, don't take the daily symptom survey. I'm just like, it's a shortcut. There's a shortcut to the daily symptom survey inside the app. You still have to take the daily symptom survey. Is I, it still being recorded or did it stop? Oh, it's still being recorded. Ah, I see. Let's do this. So what I'll do now is I'm going to stop the recording uh, uh, because I, I sense that people might want to have like an informal session where you ask things that aren't recorded. And for that, I'm actually also going to stop the YouTube streaming. So I'm going to stop recording permanently over here. Do you want to use cloud recording? If yes, you will receive an email. Yes, I do. The recording has stopped. That's done. Recording has stopped. And I'm going to say goodbye to everyone who is on YouTube. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming.